Okay, guys, I know we usually save talking about the TCG till the end of the video, but I can't hold back my excitement. I gotta talk about this. So for those of you who haven't heard, they, they showed us today that Ignister is gonna be an archetype. Ignister, my favorite synchro monster. Ignister Prominence, the blasting Draco Slayer. One of the most amazing cards that are access to pendulums. What a, one of the best mon monster removal cards they've ever introduced. This is a truly amazing card and one that is very dear to my heart. Every time I uh, go back to building pendulums, I always make room for this guy. He is always close to my heart and I can't wait to see how his new support cards will make him even more of a badass. Okay, let's take a look! Oh. 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 Hello darkness, my old friend. Anywho, we'll, we'll talk about that later. So, uh, first up, this episode this episode so uh yeah this episode pretty much threw my theory that what if that's the real yusaku out of the water which many people already figured out that this was actually i um and i'm pretty glad i'm wrong because oh my god i really he really just took this whole episode and ran with it kudos to that actor for actually being able to make i seem scary I mean, he kind of has the advantage of they took the computer aspect of Ai's voice out, so it doesn't sound exactly the same as the fun, friendly voice we're supposed to. Also, it makes it feel more grounded, which will make you relate to him more when we get into the nitty of gritty of what's going on. Uh, first up, though, I do want to talk about that design. The thing that threw me off, uh, that maybe what if this is actually the real Yusaku or an evil clone of Yusaku, is the hair. It has that very similar Yusaku feel, obviously knowing that Ai is... Designed by Yusaku, the hair makes a bit more sense. Uh, moving on from there, we have the clothes and the dual disc and the rest of the hair, and it's gaudy and it looks ridiculous, and oh god, it fits I so perfectly. That is what that character would look like, this is what he would act like, this is what he would dress like, and I like that they took a lot of time in this episode to just see him acting like I, seeing him mess with the casino, seeing him uh, turn Link Karimo into a bay. Little things like that, I think I just really enjoy. The past two Yu-Gi-Oh! villains, or at least the main ones of the arc, like Lightning and Revolver, have all been interesting and have their fascinating concepts, but I have kind of missed a Yu-Gi-Oh! villain who just kind of hams it up. And again, we don't fully know what Ai's role in this season is going to be, but we can assume he's going to be an over-the-top antagonistic type role. So it's kind of fun to see that again. Um, moving on from there, I want to cover this scene first because the rest of the episode fits in its own universe, uh, but I do just want to quickly touch upon the scene between Akira and his secretary. That was funny. <laughs> I don't know why, I like that bit where she's like, I watched the video of you a hundred times, and he's like, so you watched me faint a hundred times. She's like, oh, that was, that was just a good little joke I didn't see coming. I kind of feel sorry for this lady. Like, presumably, um, ignoring the stuff that happened with Go last arc, um, she seems like she's not, like, a bad person or anything. So to see her just kind of get shafted for uh, this show's other plethora of weird fetish waifus, it's a little sad, but hey, can you blame us when you got women like this on the show? Uh, but anyways, moving on. So that was funny. And then we get an interesting scene that at first I didn't really know where it was going. But in hindsight, when you look at the rest of the episode, I think is a real genius introduction of what I think the theme of this season is. So the first real scene of this episode is Kusunagi telling Yusaku that Jin has lost all his memories of the lost incident. This is interesting for a plethora of reasons. First up, this puts this show on a tight string for me, because as many of you know, I hate memory erase subplots, but this I think is leading to an interesting idea. So Jin tells Yusaku that because he, because his brother, or <laughs> Kusunagi says that because Jin doesn't have his memories anymore of the lost incident, he can finally start moving on. He is apparently acting healthier. Doctors say he can potentially leave soon. And that brings up the interesting idea of how do we get over trauma? If a big theme of this show has been how do we deal with trauma, then naturally the final progression of it is how do we get over it? How do we move on with our lives? Kusanagi even tells Yusaku that you can start moving on with yours too. Obviously we know there's another year's worth of story to go, 
but that's an interesting idea. Like, Kusunagi is now, Jin is now free. And I think that's sort of a unique way to think about it. And first up, uh, obviously they say that the reason it happened is because lightning converted part of Jin into one last life point, and they say that, oh, that must have just been his memories of the lost incident, and that it was just sort of a happy accident. What if it wasn't a happy accident? First up, I like they brought that up again. Uh, but what if it wasn't? What if that was Lightning's last courtesy? In the same way Bowman freed everyone he imprisoned, what if Lightning was like, eh, if this doesn't work, let the kid live? Like, that's just kind of an interesting thing to think about. What if the way you move on is to forget? Now, we've all been through trauma in life, we've all had our tragedies, and we all think to ourselves, what if I could just forget? We've all, or rather it's you've lost a loved one, rather it's you had to move or go through a traumatic experience, rather it's you were so close to topping a regional, but you didn't prepare for Orcus because the deck had only been out a week, and uh, you realized Dink Rusu's a bitch. Uh, but no, we've all been through shit, and we all wonder, what if we could just forget it all and let it all go? And that looks like it's going to be a theme here as Yusaku tries to maybe wonder what's his new place in the world. And that brings us back to what happens with I in this episode. What is I trying to do? Based on what we saw from this episode, I wants revenge. He wants to get back for the death of Earth and everything Soul Technologies has done. And he's after something and he's being motivated by that loss of basically his family. And that's a very interesting thing to see, especially when he goes after Queen. I think a lot of us expected that eventually Queen would be important, and she might still play a bit of a role going forward, but I think this was a very nice subversion of expectations. One that proves no Star Wars Episode Eight. there is a better way to get rid of Snoke. Uh, but no, I like this kind of idea that this character was built up throughout the middle season that she was powerful, she was intelligent, she was in control, and over the course of five seconds, that pretty much got taken away from her immediately. Just the idea that, like, they just get onto the boat, and because there's going to be androids everywhere in this season, this potentially means that I and Robotney can be anywhere. Like, you see, just from these this and last week's episode, the uh, androids are being ordered by a lot of businesses. They're going to be a lot. And what's sort of clever is you just see them all over the ship. They are everywhere. Potentially, those are bodies for I to take control of. And I like that idea of he can just alter any technology. He can just walk up to slot machines, make all their shit come out. He can walk past what looked like a stripper pole. Please tell me I was the only one who noticed. I know it's not a stripper pole, but it kind of looked like a stripper pole. No, but just little things like that, just establish, establishing his power level. Not everything has to be biggest, craziest thing in the world. But then he does get to Queen's uh, bedroom, and we do get big, craziest thing in the world. First up, the idea of invading someone while they're sleeping. That is a very common form of fear to go after. That idea that when you are at your most vulnerable, when you are at your simplest, when you are asleep, that is when someone will come after you which is what he does. And then both of them corner her, and then we get kind of this interesting thing of, so Link Vrain's apparently got closed down, which it really fucking should have. Uh, I do also like the bit that closing Link Vrain's had repercussions, and they talk about a lot of online businesses shutting down and all that. That is real stuff that happens with the internet when you have so many people's careers tied to things like YouTube and Instagram, and I, I don't really know a lot about this stuff. But anyways, you get my point. Uh, so that was a nice little thing there. But then I just goes into her brain and just starts fucking around. Like, in the way only I could. He's like, I want the biggest stage here, and we're gonna duel like timely gents. And during that whole bit, I completely 100% believe he's just fucking with her for the sake of fucking with her. And that's totally something I would do, and it's got this creepy feel to it. Like, anyone, potentially, he could just walk up to you, poke you, and then just go right into you and start messing around. That's a scary concept, and to see it happen to a character who has up until this point been tried to be main seem like powerful, and it just be taken down so quickly, that's a nice touch. And while we're on the subject, let's get right into the duel. I would have loved to have seen how she summons so many allure queens. <laughs> oh boy, that was ridiculous. And I love how Eyes like, impressive, you summoned a lot of monsters. Dude, that's what Yu-Gi-Oh is! 
Uh, then we get an Allure Queen Link, which feels like a big fuck you. Uh, special shout outs to all my Mystic Swordsmen and Ultimate Insect fans. Where's our Link? We deserve representation. No, but, uh, so then she does that. And all the while, while this is going on, obviously it's a nice touch. She's queen. She summons queen. Um, she always seems like she's confident. Like, she will figure out a way to turn the tables. Even when she brings her skill into it, you're like, oh no, she still feels like she can control the situation. Then I goes ham. I'd like to introduce you all to not just the Ignister archetype, and I do actually like the name convention. That was just a joke before. Uh, but also the at archetype. <laughs> Proof that they are taking this computer theme for this show a little too far. Uh, but no, like, I like that Ign uh, he's just like, here's my decode talker copy. And then he's just like, XC, Synchro. We spent a whole season building up the idea of being able to use multiple summoning conditions. I just like, Boom, baby. Here they are. I summon it like it's nothing. Take this bitch out. And that is what happens. For those of you who can't tell, because you can't see me, I don't know why I'm making a gun motion with my fingers. Oh, God, I hope my neighbors can't see me. Anyways, so yeah, he beats her, and then he leaves something for Akira to see. <laughs> I can't wait to see what that is. Maybe it's a dead body. It's probably not a dead body. I want it to be a dead body. But no, I'm super excited to see where this goes. This seems super interesting and super fascinating. So tell me what you think about all that below because I am hyped. And then for the TCG question of the week, it just became apparent to me hours before making this video that Speed Duels is having its second booster pack come out and no one in my locals cares and my card shop just ordered a box just to have their bases covered. I want to know, are Speed Duels picking up in your area and does your local support a Speed Duel tournament? Uh, I'm not saying they gotta support it every week, but just once in a while does everyone get together and do live action Duel Links format. Also Drowning Mirror 4 showed up in this episode, which is also a little bit of a Duel Links meta, but eh, that's neither here nor there. Tell me if you support this, because I don't personally Speed Duel, I kind of find Duel Links format a tad boring. But I am glad that Yu-Gi-Oh! is trying to experiment and do more things. Also, I like Ultra Rare Michizuri. Uh, but tell me what you think of that below. And as always, click to like, click subscribe, and join me next week to see if it's a dead body. I want it to be a dead body. I know it's not a dead body. Please let it be a dead body.